presentation at Lane. Or, uh, you know, and then Friday nights we do, you know, recovery bowling, you know, and we, got, we all get together. There's like thousands of people in recovery in this area because a lot of people got their kid taken away. They got in trouble with the law. They got, you know, whatever, a judge or a lawyer or a PO or somebody said, you need to clean up your act. For whatever reason, they did. And since we have such a huge drug subculture here, we also have a huge, by proxy, we have a huge recovery culture here. So it's really fun, actually. You know, we have a dance probably like once a month, at least a couple, you know, and we all get together. And, and at first you're like, well, I don't know how to dance without drugs and alcohol. But then you realize everybody feels the same way, so it doesn't matter. You all just do it, you know. You all just dance. And you feel funny at first, but then it's fun. You know, I mean, the truth is, when we were little kids, back before that first uh, age of initiation, all of us here knew how to have fun just riding our bike, going to the lake, playing a game of baseball, playing kick the can, whatever. You know, just hanging out, watching TV with friends. And then that age of initiation came up, and uh, we decided for some reason we had to have alcohol with our, with our get-togethers. And we had to have weed. You know, it's weed. It's from the earth. It's natural. You know, hey, it's all cool. Or, hey, I'm Irish. I got a drink. I'm Italian. I got a drink. Bullshit. You know? Come on. You don't need to get used mind-altering substances unless you don't feel completely comfortable with the way you feel. You want to change the way you feel so you get loaded instead of just enduring the bad times and embracing the good times. So. Um, do you have kids? Or are you married? Or? No. Thank goodness I don't have kids yet. I hope to have them someday. You know, after I get all this behind me, I do have two wonderful nephews and a wonderful niece and a bunch of wonderful cousins. So I've got a bunch of wonderful little kids in my life that I get to be around. But, uh, but luckily I don't have any of my own to put through me going away like this, you know. Thank God. But I plan on having lots of little Robbies, yeah, someday. <laughs> yes. You were talking earlier about talking with um, high school and junior high kids. What about um, the grade school level? Do you think that would impact anything, knowing that the kids are getting younger and younger that are getting pulled into this? Perhaps, but not necessarily in this area. I'm not sure. I've got a friend that's a, that I met in the program that's a principal, and I asked him to, uh, if I could, should come speak at his grade school. He was like, yeah, the kids are too little. You know, and then you get into, you know, I mean, if you're talking to a bunch of grade school kids, and then they go home and tell their parents, this guy came in and said he was a drug dealer, a drug trafficker, and he had guns, and that might not go over too good. You know, a lot of, at that point, I think the parents have control still. I don't know, you know. Remember, everything I've told you guys today is a guy that's just one year off a 20-year meth binge. So, I mean, <laughs> put that into, into perspective, I mean, I... I just have my experience, and it's just all it is. I, no, no, nothing I say is necessarily accurate except for the part about my story, which I've told you. My, my theories on society and, and, and sobriety and treatment are just what I've learned. But I guarantee the parts about my story are true. Yes? Are you um, on any other drugs, such as uh, smoking, caffeine, or pharmaceuticals? I quit, I quit smoking when I got one year clean, which was 11-11 of just last year, just a few months ago, because I, you know, I didn't start smoking heavily until I got into treatment. <laughs> we were all sitting there, that's what we did, you know, we smoked. And then, uh, so I, was a, I became a, pretty much an avid smoker, but I quit after I got a year clean, right off the year clean. So I've been cleaning off cigarettes now for a few months. I do take uh, small dosage of Zoloft every day. Uh, keeps me, takes out the peaks and valleys, but... Uh, I don't know if they're going to allow me to have that in prison or not, so I might be in for a rude awakening. Maybe they will. Hopefully in the feds they will let me have some Zoloft. I don't know. They're supposed to, but they may or may not. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, you got a really good thing going for you because you've not only quit the drugs, but you've put something in its place. And you're taking responsibility for, you know, what's happened to you. And not only that, but figured out a way to make it a positive. Thank you. There's a, you know, and that's what I recommend to my friends all the time. I mean, there is, I mean, if I can be happy and I'm about to go to prison and the programs work, recovery works, um, I am luckier than most in that I have a very loving family. You know, they've been very supportive. They were shocked at first. We all had a big cry, you know, and then it was, okay, what can we do to help, you know? How can we love you? You know, they don't, they don't, well, they, my, I mean, I'm not going to talk about my family, but they're not in the drug scene. You know, I mean, a couple of them drink occasionally, 
socially, but uh, some of them don't even drink, you know, it's just, they're a very supportive family, and that's one thing I've got that I'm lucky for, you know, and I just tell all my friends, you know, even if you don't have that, you know, the program still works. I got other friends in the pro recovery program that don't have as supportive a family as me, but yet they're happy, and, uh, you know, I, I also think that, uh, I think that, I think that you can choose to be happy. I think a lot of people become professional whiners or professional victims or they're just more comfortable having a problem every day than they are with having a solution. Uh, it's the old adage, cup half full, cup half empty, you know. Um, we're all going to have bad things happen to us, you know. People die, chronic disease, all kinds of things. And, and, and that is worthy of, you know, mourning for a season. But then it's, you know, I think you can choose to get past it, look past it, get happy. And, and uh, you know, if you don't believe me, ask Zig Ziglar. He'll tell you. <laughs> well, they, they just gave me the five-minute uh, right. five signal. Anything else? Yeah. Um, because the drugs are so available, how would you, would you, what would you change to make, I mean, the whole problem better? Because... It seems like they're really easy to get a hold of and really easy to get addicted to because they're so rampant. But how do you go about trying to fix that problem? Well, you know, um, I think it comes down to all of you and me and what's each person going to do. And, Mark, what are we all going to do to influence the people in our sphere? Are we going to be, you know, good people, a role model, a do-gooder? Are we going to, you know, you can tell when you're doing good or bad, you know. Are you going to fight to be the best person you can be? Are you going to pray for the strength to do God's will? Are you going to try to be a good person? That's all, that's all we can do. With, when you're looking at something like drugs, when you take something that has a high demand and you make it illegal, as long as there's a demand, there will be a supply. I don't care if you give me the death penalty for being a drug dealer. There will be a supply. So what we've got to do is work on the demand side. Let the law enforcement officials work on the supply side. That's their job, and good for them. They're doing a good job, you know. But my job and your guys' job is to work on the demand side. That's all we can do, you know, be there. And one thing about counseling I want to tell you guys, I love the counselors at the treatment center that, uh, that I went to. Some of them I don't like, but I love them all. One thing that happens if you guys really do become drug counselors is there was a study back east somewhere. I hate giving vague vague statistics, but there was a study back there where they had like 10 college kids and 10 college kids. They made a mock prison, and 10 of them were prisoners, 10 of them were guards. At the end of the week, <laughs> the prisoners were <laughs> about ready to go crazy because the guards were having a power and control issues. When you're a counselor, you know, negative reinforcement is probably going to be necessary a lot because a lot of people, that's what they need, that's what they know to learn. But don't forget about the positive reinforcement. That was really overlooked, I think, at the treatment center I went to. There was very little positive reinforcement. And I think that if you guys are going to be drug counselors, you're getting into a good profession because right now the success rate is like one out of 50 or something like that. Business I mean, is booming. Business is booming, yeah. <laughs> if you come up with a cure, whether it be more positive reinforcement or some sort of formula to make it work that people don't use, and they don't go back into active addiction, <laughs> you're going to get rich. And you're probably going to save our country and our planet, you know, because this stuff is rampant. This drug addiction stuff is just crazy. It's everywhere. Yes, sir? Positive reinforcement, though. Don't forget about that when you're being a drug counselor. I was just going to say, in some states I know in California, they're trying to make it more of a medical than a criminal problem. Not for the dealer, necessarily, yeah. but for those that are using it. So let's, you know, rather than sticking them in prison for six months or... Uh, any place where they're incarcerated with a bunch of people who are criminals, treating them more like this is a medical, this is a, a, you know, a mental or a medical or physical issue that should be dealt with through counseling you know, and not through turning them into criminals. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I have my own thoughts and feelings on, you know, I remember right after getting busted, I heard about a judge in Vermont that, uh, you know, was getting taken off the bench because she gave a child molester two months of probation. Yeah, I remember that. And, you know, and I'm, I got caught with a big bag of drugs, and I'm doing eight years. You know, who's worse, the child molester or the drug two dealer? Two minutes. Well, the guy gets caught with a couple of grams of meth, and he's in the jail cell with a guy that murdered a couple of people. Yeah. Well, what's going to happen to him in the six months or a year 
before he gets out of there. What's going to happen to his head, right. his mentality, his attitude on life. That's what I'm talking about. I think, that, I think that 